Welcome everyone to Inside Academia, the weekly program where we take a look behind the ivory curtain seeking a frank discussion on American education. I'm your host, Andy Nash, and my guest today is Dr. Kevin Williamson. He's a deputy managing editor at National Review, author of Exchequer, a blog on debts and deficits at National Review Online. He's also a theater critic for the New Criterion and an adjunct professor at King's College in New York City, as well as an, the author of the just released book, the Politically Incorrect Guide to Socialism. Uh, Kevin Williamson, welcome to our program. How are you today? Good, thanks. I, although I have to start off with the correction. I'm not doctor anything. Uh, <laughs> I, do, I do teach a college class, but I don't have a, a PhD or anything like that. Okay, thanks. So, it's just, so just Kevin will work. All right. Nonetheless, uh, you, your, your new book, uh, Politically Incorrect, Incorrect Guide to Socialism, as with the rest of the entire Politically Incorrect Guide series, reveals many things of topics they cover. In this case, in your case, you're talking about socialism. I want to focus on two chapters on your book that deal with education. And uh, so just to start off, what exactly is about American contemporary public education that is, in your view, socialist or socialistic? Well, it's, it's simply a question of the form of economic organization uh, with American education from kindergarten through high school and then on to the university level in, in most circumstances. What you have is direct government provision of goods and services. You know, it's the difference between the welfare program and socialism is whether the government actually owns and operates the, uh, the, the means of production, as it were. So you might say that a food stamp program would be an example of a, of a typical welfare state program. But socialism is something different. That's government owning the farms or the grocery stores, things like that, actually being involved in the organizing of the business. So our schools are very much like that. Our schools are very much organized along the lines that are you would have to describe it as classically socialistic. And by the way, I, I don't use that term socialistic as a, as a pejorative. I mean, I, I'm anti-socialist, and uh, I don't think it's a good thing, but I really just want to use it as a descriptive term for government provision of non-public goods. Okay. Uh, what, what exactly, give me an example of um, what you find troublesome or, or problematic about that. Well, it doesn't work, uh, is the main thing. It's, um, it's a horribly... Uh, ineffective, expensive, uh, unaccountable system that doesn't do a very good job for the people that we really wanted to do a good job for. You know, the reason we have things like public schools or other kinds of public services, really, is because we're concerned about the situation of people who are poor or people who otherwise do not have a lot of assets and connections and the ability to take care of themselves. You know, we don't say we've got public schools for these poor millionaires' kids because, you know, they would go to private schools and they would do fine anyway. They would get the sort of education that their parents wanted them to get and have the means to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And in the public school system, you see that that very much is still the case. Whether you're, um, you know, in the Northeast or the South or in California or other sorts of places, you know, relatively well-off people in relatively well-off neighborhoods in the suburbs or in very wealthy areas in the big cities have good schools, whether they're public schools, whether they're private schools. You know, you're sort of affluent, white, politically connected middle class can get good public services. You know, the same way they get better law enforcement services, the same way they have nicer sidewalks and better garbage pickup. Right. The people that we're really concerned about helping are people who don't have that kind of access to, uh, to money and assets and, and influence. And the public schools do a terrible job for those kids. You know, if you look at Philadelphia, you look at Washington, you look at New York City, you look at Los Angeles, you look at San Francisco, Cincinnati, Chicago, Denver, any of that you know, big U.S. cities, you'll see that you know, the poor, and especially the non-white poor, are the ones who are absolutely worst served by the schools that allegedly are there to serve them as a public enterprise. Okay, and so, so then how do, you, how, do you, how do you explain that? How is it that some public schools are performing fairly well, yet other public schools are, are not? Is it the fact that they're public? Because then how do you explain the ones that are performing well? Yeah, well, there are two ways about that. One is that kids from more affluent families get lots of educational support outside of the school system. If they've got problems, they get tutors, they get extra classes. Um, their parents also have the ability to demand better service from their schools. Um, you know, they've got a lot of clout, a lot of influence. If you're someone living in a million-dollar house in Lower Marion, Pennsylvania, uh, you've got a lot more clout as a taxpayer than you do as someone living in West Philadelphia across the street, which you can tell the difference in the schools, just obviously. So. Partly it's that, uh, partly it's, it's systematic, 
And partly it's the fact that the very wealthy school districts can get by with, with a lot of waste. You know, Lower Marion Place, I just mentioned, uh, spends just damn near $30,000 a year per student in its public schools. Now, its uh, outcomes are not a third better or twice as, or 50% better than places that spend $20,000 a year, and they're surely not three times better than most places that spend $10,000 a year. But when you're a community that's that wealthy, that well off, you don't notice the waste as much. You don't yes. notice the fraud as much. But, um, but if you're a relatively poor school district or a relatively poor community, your margin of error for those sorts of assets and those sorts of cash flows is pretty low. So you take a place like Philadelphia or Washington where, you know, all socialistic enterprises have, you know, sort of a gross misallocation of capital and resources. You don't miss it as much if you're, you know, gazillionaire suburbs outside of some, you know, nice place. So um, I guess the, the question I have for you, I was reading through your book here, and it, and it said that you write here that um, a lot of the things that are driving up the cost of public education, you mentioned – uh, uh, teachers pursuing higher degrees, master's degrees, PhDs. Uh, you mentioned mm -hmm. that they uh, try to reduce class sizes in the hopes that uh, that would uh, be conducive for better quality education for the students. Uh, you mentioned a number of ancillary non-instructional expenses for, for the teachers and everything else, administrate some of the wasteful bureaucracies that you mentioned. Uh, all of these things contributing to drastically increasing the costs of public education. However, there's no return for it for what we're putting in. Uh, more spending for less output uh, is, is the result. Um, and that's, you, that's what you concluded in the book. So my question is, how do you measure, first of all, to make an honest comparison, how do you measure the performance of the school? Is it just by students having better test scores, or how do you gauge that to begin with to be able to make the comparison? Yeah, I mean, test scores are one way to do it, college attendance rates, graduation rates. There are lots of metrics across which one might want to evaluate the school system. And, and different school systems serve different kinds of communities and different sorts of populations, and so you might look at different metrics. You know, you might not look at, say, final test scores, but how they change over the course of the kids being there. You know, the kids in first grade maybe started off really low, but fifth grade they were better, and by graduation they are really good. What actually happens in most of our big urban school systems is, that is the opposite. We have kids in fourth and fifth grade who perform reasonably well compared to other kids around the world. By the time they are uh, of graduation age, they're years and years behind. So on that metric, our schools are actually leaving the kids, you know, in some sense, worse off than they were before they started. Uh, but whatever reasonable metric you choose, I think you'll find that in the great majority of cases, our public schools simply don't do a reasonably good job, particularly considering the abundance of resources they're given. You know, all the teachers and administrators are always complaining this and that. You know, we don't spend enough money on education, don't spend enough money on education. You know, if you look at the chart of education spending since, you know, 1960, 1970, it just goes up like that. It's, uh, it's been, uh, looks like I was making a TV show, doesn't it? It looks, uh, you know, it's not quite a 45 degree angle, but we spend a lot more in real dollars, you know, in adjusted, in inflation adjusted dollars than per pupil than we used to on education. And we're simply getting less for it. And, you know, one other thing you said that they want to shrink class size in order to get better educational results. I, I don't believe that. You know, they know because they follow the pedagogical literature that there is no statistical correlation within a very broad band between class size and educational outcomes. You don't get much better performance from a class of 12 students than you do from a class of 20 students or 25 students. Now, once you get about 50, 60 students, you start to see some, some results, but we're not talking about that anywhere in almost any public classroom in the country. Right. Well, on the top of the public schools. You, you mentioned in the book how um, in an attempt to try to get uh, better quality out of students or in terms of the education given to the students, the, uh, they try to reduce the class size, and you've cited some statistical studies that show that there's really no direct correlation to so whether you've got a class of 20 kids or 40 kids or something like that. Uh, it's not going to make it's no There's no appreciable difference for the amount that right. we put in to having to separate those groups and have separate classrooms and so on. So we're getting very little, if any, return for the costs that we sink into it. So I guess the conclusion to infer here is that a private system can figure out how to do, do this all better. So why why does the state do it? Is that the right? Is that the conclusion here? Yeah, and it's it's actually even a little farther than that. You know, the idea that there is a better model of education is, I think, in and of itself problematic because I don't think that there is a model of education. You know, we've got 900 kinds of shampoo and one kind of school, basically. You know, we think everyone needs the same sort of education. We treat students as though they're, 
you know, interchangeable parts in some Samuel Colt assembly line, and that's not what they are. They're human beings, and they've got, you know, a great deal of complexity and individuality about them. Uh, we probably need, you know, a, a thousand different models of education. There are different people who have different interests, different talents, and different abilities who need to be educated in different kinds of ways, but we treat it like an assembly line. You know, it's... Uh, it's, it's appropriate that the sort of school system we adopted in the 19th century was the one essentially dreamed up by Otto von Bismarck. You know, the sort of very authoritarian Prussian kind of system that's uh, characterized by a high level of standardization, this kind of you know, mass production mentality toward education, which obviously is bad. I mean, there's no, there's no way of getting around it it's, that it's a failure. Well, uh, let me just kind of draw a parallel with uh, higher education, if I may. In higher education, in colleges and universities, they view um, undergraduate education as a cost item, and they do everything they can to, to you know, stem the, the cost of that, meanwhile raising tuition and, and getting as much public support in the name of educating the public. And I'll give you an example with respect to class sizes. Uh, when you have classes of hundreds of students, they, uh, not 50 or 60, but several hundred, you know, they, they hire uh, adjuncts and they hire people they don't have to pay as professors and TEAs and teaching assistants and so on to do more of the teaching, more of the grading. And um, they, they limit the amount of the costs, and, but at the same time, they're raising the price. So in a way, they're, they're doing the opposite of what public education is doing at the elementary and secondary school level. Uh, but that, that's not serving, that's not bringing about any better results either in terms of the quality of education that's being bestowed upon the undergraduates because their focus there is on research. Yeah, I think that, I think the problem with higher education isn't so much socialism as it is corruption. Uh, higher education is a system in which a very small group of people have maneuvered themselves into a kind of political spot where they can do a lot of rent extraction, you know, where they can get jobs for life, where they can have... Uh, you know, security without accountability, with a, you know, very high wages, uh, especially when you consider uh, benefits and pensions and all the rest of the stuff that's built into professorial salary, uh, particularly administrator salaries. You know, I mean, college presidents make you know, approaching seven figures, some of them, uh, so yeah. maybe even more than that. Uh, that's that's a lot of cash. You know, it's it's not exactly Socrates uh, in front of the academy and the and the in the tree and all that stuff. So, um, you know, it's a system by which they've established BA as the credentialing mechanism for the good life. That you can't get a real job, even if it has a secretary or, or journalist or some other non field profession, unless you've got a uh, BA. And uh, so it's a kind of you know hostage situation where you, you have to get the college degree in most cases to get yourself in any sort of a real middle class life. And so they can offer you very little service uh, at very high rates, and of course the rates that you pay out of pocket are not nearly, you know, what they're actually collecting. You know, I went to public schools in Texas, the University of Texas, and my tuition, you know, covered probably 15% of the cost of my education, but they're extracting a lot of money from the state. You know, the uh, chancellor at the time said we only charge tuition under graduates as a population control, just to keep some people out, you know, it's a way to not have to raise standards. So, um, it's, it's just kind of an anti uh, system where there's not a great deal of competition, but there is a great deal of collusion, where you've got the you know, supplier uh, cabal to which the consumer is uh, absolutely beautiful in lots and lots of ways. Right. So, um, it's, yeah, it's, it's just an ugly system. You know, I still think that even, even in that case, you find that the purely private institutions still tend to manage their affairs better than the public institutions do. You know, I, mean, I like the University of Texas a lot. It's a great place to go to school, and I'm grateful for the education I receive there. But I don't think it manages its business affairs as well as, you know, Harvard or Bryn Mawr College or some places like that. Well, and so it certainly doesn't manage it, its academic affairs as well. So, some would argue that the public subsidy of many of these institutions is not helping the competition uh, of, of uh, these universities in terms of education and that it further feeds into the problem. But anyway, that's all, all the time we have today. Again, your new book out is called The Politically Incorrect Guide to Socialism, uh, out by Regnery Publishing. Uh, Kevin Williamson, uh, Deputy Managing Editor at National Review, I want to thank you again for joining us today. Thanks so much. I appreciate it.
You're welcome. Thanks again for joining us. This has been Inside Academia with Andy Nash. Uh, check us out on the web at insideacademia.tv, and be sure to follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Join us again next week and every week as we take a look behind the Ivory Curtain.